So this is the uh, in the game the movie panel, uh, and we have here Jean Pajot and James Whiskey, or say it in Polish. Yeah. So let's just kind of you know see what the movie is all about. I am determined to make video games, and I make video games because I can. I mean, it's the sum total of every expressive medium of all times made interactive. Like, how is that not... It's awesome! My whole career has been me trying to find new ways to communicate with people because I desperately want to communicate with people, but I don't want the messy interaction of having to make friends and talk to people because I probably don't like them. And it's not just a game, like, it's, I'm, I'm so closely attached to it. This is my identity. It's Fez. I'm guy making Fez. You know, that's, that's about it. You know, making it was about, let me take my deepest flaws and vulnerabilities and put them in the game. I'm on the line, me, like my name, my career. If this if this fails, like I don't think I uh, I'll work in games again. I'm like in a fucking concentration camp. If if you can't get if you just if you can't get the work done, uh, then the past two years are basically worth nothing. No pressure. All you've been doing for four years is look at this, like this close, like. You can't see anything else. You don't even see the mistakes in it anymore. What the fuck is that? Cool. So uh, I'm curious, um, first of all, um, so I, I love the movie. I watched it three times by now, and every time I kind of want to do something. You know, the first, first time I decided I should make a documentary because it's finally very easy and we're going to hear all about it. <laughs> uh, the second one, I wanted to write an indie game movie. Uh, I want to write an indie game. And the third time, I haven't really processed it yet because it was two days ago, but uh, we'll see. But um, I'm curious, well, first of all, how did it all start? How, how did you the idea cool um yeah it all kind of started with um like prior to doing the movie we um had a kind of commercial uh corporate video uh gig and we kind of worked on that uh, for about the last seven years or so and uh we actually got hired by the canadian government to do a series of profiles on uh winnipeg uh tech stories and one of them was on this guy alec Loka, who along with derek Yu, made this uh great game uh called aquaria that won like the biggest prize you could possibly win in independent gaming back in like 2007, I think. And uh, we got tasked with making like this short little five minute piece on it. And we thought it was going to be kind of like this kind of like fluffy, kind of light, oh, a guy made a game and isn't that cool type of video. And um, ultimately we did make that video, but the process of making that video and talking now, like, the story was just so much more. It was kind of this story about this guy who ended up making one game or thought he was making one game and then ended up with this completely different game that reflected all this stuff that he was going through in his life while making the game. It became like darker and more emotional. It was just his experience of making the game was completely tied to the game itself. And so it was this whole idea of games being used as story or expression that was new to us. It's not a new idea, but it was kind of something new to us, like seeing someone in their own game so much. And then shortly after that, we went down to the Game Developers Conference, which we had been going to for various reasons for a couple of years. And we were hanging around the Independent Game Summit, and we just kept on hearing 
story after story of very similar things, like people pouring everything they had into their game and these really dramatic uh, dev cycles. And we thought to ourselves, like, if we can get that, like, in a movie, if we can kind of get that on tape or, or just even a semblance of that, like, that's something that we would love to watch. And then we kind of, like, looked around uh, for, like, video game design documentaries, and there were hardly any. There, there were very few. I think Get Lamp by Jason Scott was, like, the only one I could find. And um, we thought, this needs to exist. Why hasn't someone told the story? There needs to be a Helvetica or Objectified of video games. And we set out kind of with the idea of making that. In the end, we made something quite, quite different. But um, that, that was kind of our, our first impetus of it, is um, Alec leading to GDC, leading to something needs to exist. Let's make it. And, and um, as far as I remember, you, your original idea for the movie, and you actually had a cut of some sort uh, that turned out to be something completely different than, than w what we can see today. Uh, so it, was it kind of like the same story for you, that you, 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 know, you made a movie and, and then you realize you have to remake it again just to say something different? Yeah, like we, we started out... Um, interviewing lots of different developers like because we really didn't know where this would land or we, we didn't really know what it was we knew that it was going to be a film about indie games and so we called it indie game the movie on like the first day that's all like we, it, was it was a just working title project. um and um yeah so we thought the film would involve a lot more developers and we, we interviewed a lot of people but throughout the process we ended up spending more and more time with uh the creators of the of the the three main games in the film super meat boy fez and braid and the way we met these people were we were like, hey, Alec, who should we talk to? And that's sort of how it started. And we started reaching out to people and talking to people that were in the, in the process of making games, but a lot had already made their games. Um, and we thought the film would be this sort of marriage of um, a story, like someone making and releasing a game. And then in between, you jump off to all these different people that had made games and you find out more about them and more about the process. But it just turned into this more of a journey film following these three games. So it was very different. Our first cut of the film was about three hours long and really awful. It, it just wasn't a good uh, movie. Are you going to include it on the DVD or Blu-ray? Yeah, or? we're going to cut it apart and, and, <laughs> and make it make it better. <laughs> make it more digestible. On the special edition. but. Yeah, no, like the, the project really sort of morphed as, you know, we were discovering what the movie was throughout. The first thing that we had done was we actually went down to Santa Cruz, where we're staying right now, and uh, we filmed with Edmund and, and Tommy from Super Meat Boy, and we shot this little piece, and we put it up on the web on May 2010 on Kickstarter, and this is early days for Kickstarter. Not many people were using it, and we made our, our goal, which was a modest goal of $15,000 in, like, less than two days. And that to us, that was a huge thing. It was like a life-changing moment to have all these people around the world, like 300 people, um, decide that they wanted to support this film. And it sounds small, but to us, as two filmmakers from Winnipeg, it was like, it was huge. And that's, that's what made us decide to, it sounds kind of silly now, it, like, it made us decide to like, give up our work and, and, and take this on as, a, as, a, as like a goal for the next year. We thought it would take a year to make the film, and it ended up taking two years. So, um, and so Kickstarter was one of the kind of interesting aspects of, 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 of kind of your project, right? And, and you, 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 went, you were really, really open about the whole process throughout making of the movie, right? You were, I think, posted like 90 minutes worth of video as you were working on it, which by then, like, why would you ever watch a movie if you already saw 90 minutes of video, right? That's what a lot of film people were saying to us. They're like, oh, you're giving away all your DVD extras. What are you doing? Um, yeah, it was it was 90 minutes, but only five minutes are actually in the movie. So it was all extras. Yeah, it's kind of a problem. Yeah, we could make about 20 <laughs> movies out of the, the footage we recorded. We still have like, we have three, we shot 300 hours. It was kind of silly. Like, it, we just kept shooting. We're still shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but in, in, a, in a good way, I think. Yeah. Is we, we, you know, discovered the movie through that process. Like, it, we're finding, like, with documentaries, like, there's just so much... Um, it's really easy to call it like wasted effort. Like we, we've done and edited and shot so many things that just ultimately wasn't right for the movie, but you have to kind of explore, you know, those stories and those characters and see if those techniques work. And um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Like when you look at like all the stuff that didn't make it into the movie, it's, it's just a whole bunch of like expended effort, um, which, yeah, but I think made for a better movie. Yeah. Yeah. But, so we did, we did share a lot. So we put out all these little pieces of things that were like, oh, this won't make it in the movie. Let's just cut something from the hotel where we're shooting and, and put it up on the internet. And, 
And we just wanted to share as much as we could because we felt this immense amount of responsibility to these 300 people. Um, and then that sort of community grew over the course of making the film. And, and that's really what, you know, gave us a lot of confidence to move forward and be like, yeah, this is a good idea, sort of. Yeah. We're also really inspired by like uh, what indie game developers themselves were doing at the time, like uh, you know doing things like pre-orders and open betas, and just being really painfully honest about you know where their game's at and where their game's heading. And we saw all these great examples of people kind of building up their audiences even before their game was released, or even a long before time before their game was released. And that kept like the audience engaged and it kept them engaged. And I just really like the idea of working that way, of kind of sharing about the movie as we're making it. Um, and so we kind of embraced that wholeheartedly and kind of put out all this content and let people know where we were going with it. And it had, for the most part, I think, really positive effects. Like, like it got people excited and we kind of hit the ground running when it came time to June. It, we didn't have to, like, you know, bring a whole bunch of people up to speed as to, like, what we're, what we're doing. And I think we probably saved a lot of marketing dollars that way. Um, it does have, like, this weird effect of kind of enhancing, like, this kind of weird time warp that happens on the Internet when you're kind of paying attention to something to something for a long long time you know like if you watch something on the internet for like a year it seems like three years or four years and you know it just it, there's like a weird kind of dog year phenomenon so we, we like people you know even though they only been paying attention for eight months it felt like three years so you know doing it again we probably manage it a little bit different but not too too different yeah and um so what happened afterwards uh you i think you had another kickstarter campaign and and then all sorts of wonderful things started happening, right? And uh, I remember you had this blog post eventually chronicling uh, the timeline of the movie, and it's just like amazing. Just just and trying to just read that, what what you know, what kind of things happened afterwards. So I was curious if you can recap that for us. Yeah, something significant. Like it, when you're working on a project like this, it's all consuming, and it was really all consuming for us. But when we looked back at the at the timeline, there was something significant that happened like every two weeks, <laughs> which we're kind of tired, but. Uh, we um, we did another Kickstarter campaign because the film had transformed into something different. We felt like at first it would be this film that we would put out on the internet and people would like and, and, and that would be that. But then it sort of grew into something that we could see as like a theatrical film, like to put in theaters and, and it had a story and it was tense and emotional. And so we needed a, a, a bit more money to finish it because basically $23,000 was our, our budget and just our time. Uh, James and I did all the shooting and the editing and, and all the stuff ourselves. So it was just time that we needed. But at that point, we had to bring on, uh, we brought on a composer and we had to do some color correction and things like that. So we um, appealed to the community again. And by this time, there was more people following the project. And uh, we made, yeah. This, so, this is the second page. Yeah. And, and we made that in a day. And so that was, uh, that, that so. was shocking. So you should, you should have you should have gone with the third one and the fourth one. And yeah, just, <laughs> just keep delaying just it. See how yeah. Uh, no, that that was an awesome uh, sort of vote of confidence again, and, and made us feel really good, and gave us enough money to pay a composer and and finish the movie. And uh, and and the the so the the soundtrack is about the only thing you were not really responsible for yourselves, right? Yeah, and, and, and the five one mixing, we we got a company to do that. But uh, and there was also an interesting kind of indie gameish story, right? The the finding finding the composer. Oh yeah, yeah. Basically, when we were kind of making the movie and editing it, uh, I was playing this game, Sword and Sorcery, uh, by by Cappy Bear, it's Super Brothers game. Um, and yeah, it was the the music in that game is amazing. It's done by the guy Jim Guthrie, who's also Canadian, and. Um, we kind of kept on going back and forth because we, we were scoring the music or the movie with temp music and with the social network. Yeah, yeah, and we we never <laughs> we we never worked with a composer before, so we didn't really know you know how how to go about this. And um, so we thought like, wouldn't it be amazing if you know the guy who did this game, uh, Jim Guthrie, if, if he did our music? So we shot him an email, thinking that there's no way he's going to do this because he's actually a rock star in Canada. He, like, he has like a like a the equivalent of a Grammy in Canada. So. The Juno. Yeah. So <laughs> we were just like, oh, he's never going to reply. Let's just email him anyway. And within like ten hours, he said, yeah, let's do it. And he had watched the first cut of the film. Yeah, we, yeah. we actually have this email right here. Yeah, yeah. We, this because at Google we kind of no, I, I, <laughs> you had it on your, on your blog. Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this was the very first feedback we got uh, from a rough cut of the film. Not the three-hour cut, but f this is the first time anyone has seen it. 
Uh, and this was huge for us. Not only was it just the first time we got positive feedback and, and it had, you know, fucks and everything. Like people were, he was excited. And yeah. And, and it's how you know it's true, right? Yeah, yeah, completely. Because there's four exclamation points. Um, yeah. And, and so it, it, was, it was amazing. But not only that, but it was the guy that we really, really, really wanted to work with. Um, and then from there, he just started making music. And he made all the music for the movie in about two months, maybe even a little less than that. that. Like five weeks. Like it was a crazy crunch. He did 80 we were... minutes of new music in five weeks. He worked crazy. He doesn't really sleep. He only sleeps four hours a day. So yeah. it worked out for us. And everything he gave us was just, just perfect and fantastic and took the movie in places we didn't think it would. And it was just like a dream experience you know, with a, composer. Oh, it an album um, online. JimGuthrie.org. Yeah, JimGuthrie, yeah, look it up. So, um, what what happened afterwards? Cool. Well, that, <laughs> at that point, uh, yeah, we were kind of it was turning into this thing, and Jim's music was making it so much better. And we um, we applied uh, for uh, festivals, and we were working up towards a festival deadline. And we thought if we got into any sort of film festival, which really wasn't our plan initially, we'd get into a Canadian one, and then we yeah. got rejected. <laughs> It really sucked because <laughs> yeah. we thought if we're going to get into any like upper tier festival it'll be a canadian one because you know they have like home court advantage and they have to show so many canadian films and so <laughs> you know hopefully we're one of the top five canadian documentaries that year and uh, so we maybe we weren't two festivals <laughs> and and we got into one but we didn't get into the big one and so we were a little disappointed and uh but then a few weeks later uh we found out that we got into sundance which sort of changed everything which was just such a, a huge thing we, we just never thought that this little film, like, no. we always, like, who, like, on, in our plan, you, like, write down your plan, okay, make the movie, get the great composer, then go to Sunday. Premier like, you Sundance. Don't, you don't write that down. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of a big thing for us. Cool. And, uh, and that, you, we also did something interesting with distribution, right? Um, yeah. After. Yeah, kind of like, uh, we went to, to Sundance, and, um, like, the, the whole process of making this movie, we, kind of treated it, you know, very pragmatic and very practical. And we had our idea of DIY distribution, like what would happen if we got no distribution deal or anything like that, you know, we would go, we'll take it out on tour and then we'll kind of release it ourselves where, where we can, and then we'll distribute it online and all this stuff. So we had the, this really base plan of what we wanted to do ourselves. And then once you got into Sundance, things change and they change really quickly and really dramatically. Um, but at the same time, they didn't change for us. Uh, but we got like all these, we got 1,000 emails that day. It was announced that we were in Sundance. And then the next day, we got like 800 emails and then 600. And it was just like this crazy, overwhelming crush of opportunity um, that you had to kind of sift through. And we went into Sundance thinking, okay, well, let's listen to absolutely everything. Um, we have ideas of what we can do and what would be good. But, you know, we might, this, we're new to everything. So we thought, let's embrace traditional distribution where it makes sense and you know do what we want where it doesn't make sense or it doesn't so so generally when people go to a big festival like sundance or Cannes or, or or the toronto international film festival is you go there and you show your movie and then you have like a sales agent who's like a real estate agent and then they try to get everyone ex all the buyers really excited about your movie and try to get them to bid against each other so they'll give you like a million dollars in one night well that didn't really happen uh <laughs> that didn't really happen we weren't really banking on it um uh, but we did get lots of interest, and, and the film ended up being optioned by HBO and Scott Rudin to make into a TV series, a, a fictional TV series, which was kind of insane. Scott Rudin happens to be the producer of The Social Network, which is bizarre. Um, Karma for using their score, right? I know, yes. uh, as temp music. Um, and, uh, and we got lots of offers and, and lots of excitement, and we did lots of interviews with, like, German glamour. It was just very weird. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but then we decided we didn't want to sell it. We didn't, there wasn't, you know, everybody was saying that the film would, would, you know, wouldn't be able to come out until the fall and they'd push it out theatrically and then they'd control the digital. And our worry was we had at this point about 10,000 people that had pre-ordered the movie and from all over the world. And so our concern was if we put it out traditionally, people wouldn't receive it at the same time because generally distribution happens per territory. We, we were just learning all of this stuff. Um, and so we decided not to sell it and do it ourselves. So we took the film out on tour. We did a tour across the States with a partner, uh, Adobe. And then uh, it went in theaters uh, in 12 centers, which we booked ourselves, and 37 in Canada. And then we put it out online uh, our, ourselves uh, on iTunes, 
uh, Steam, uh, a big gaming platform, and uh, our own website on June 12th worldwide. And that hadn't really been done before for a feature film. Um, and luckily it worked out. <laughs> it was kind of stressful, but... W was this actually the first movie on Steam? Yeah. Yeah, th there was a short movie made by a couple of Valve employees that happened like, a, I think, six years ago or so. But this is like the first feature film uh, on Steam. And it's, it's been great. Like, it's it's absolutely perfect place for it. It's sitting right next to Super Meat Boy and Braid and World of Goo. And, yeah, it's just perfect. Yeah. Through the distribution part. And uh, I guess it brings us to what was the reaction from people who watched it. Because the, the interesting part about this movie is that, uh, as you as you mentioned, you, you could you could have done it a number of different ways, right? You could have focused on the technology or the history of indie games. And... and this and or you know or like 15 different developers just kind of chatting uh, randomly and you you decided to tell essentially two three stories of of three different games but not as much games as people behind those games right and uh and you know was this something that surprised people uh you know who who were expecting something else and and you know did you get different reaction from people who maybe are not gamers and, and then, you know, all of these hardcore, you know, uh, hardcore people who, who, you know, played all of these games before and, and they were like, we wanted to know more about those games rather than about the people. Yeah, yeah, like, I think the, the film ended up uh, turning into something really strong, in part because we focused on it, but also uh, the, the guys that we focused on in the film were really generous with their thoughts. And um, they were really generous with us and, and with the audience in terms of how vulnerable they are at times. Like, it's a stressful movie. Um, a lot of, like, it's we were filming people at the most stressful points in their lives, and little did we know it would get so stressful. Um, and I think people bizarrely connect with that. And so no matter whether you're a gamer or you're... Oh, that, that's a, he's a little stressed there. Um, we have more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No matter whether you're a gamer or a developer or just a maker, um, we, we related to it, so we hoped other people would relate to it too, and people really connect with their stories because they share so much, and there's so much themselves uh, in the film, in these sort of uh, super in intense moments. And so it sort of transcended beyond just people that were, were into gaming, and we were really, we wanted that, but we were really sort of surprised by that. Mm -hmm. At every screening, there's always kind of, uh, like we do Q&As and stuff like that, there's always someone that is usually... Usually, like a woman in her, her 40s or 50s that kind of like it was like brought there by a son or just kind of brought there because she likes documentaries or something. But she'll kind of like ask a question, but the question's like more like a statement. And she's just, <laughs> and we've gotten this like four or five times. And um, it's always something to the effect of, you know, I don't play games. I don't like games. I, I never pick up a controller. But games are kind of, they're, they're kind of like art, right? And, and, and it was like this, this revelation uh, to, to her. And, and that's kind of, this kind of dream reaction that we could, you know, kind of hope for. And we've gotten that kind of over and over again of just people that have never really thought about games in this way. And, and that's fine because it's not part of their lives. Like, there's no reason for them to, you know, kind of really consider games as something more than just these little play things. Um, but when we do get into, when we do get those people into the theater and, and they do actually kind of change their opinion of games in some little way, like it doesn't, they're not going out and buying an Xbox or anything like that. But it's just they, they, they're a little more thoughtful towards game. A huge victory, like an amazing victory. Yeah, so we got a lot of that. Yeah. Do, do you think anybody um, who watched this movie decided that they're gonna go indie, like right now? Um, <laughs> it's funny. We, we were sort of talking about this earlier. The the film sort of, and and I think a lot of programming works this way. You see yourself, like people ad identify with certain characters in the film, or or a read in what they want. It's sort of like a personality test in a way. So if you walk out of this film thinking. Uh, oh yeah, I want to make a game that means that you're a little bit of an idealist, and and that's wonderful. Um, or if you walk away and be like, ugh, I don't want to become independent at all. Um, it, it's people read into their their sort of own things. So when we were on tour, we had a lot of people come up, and we in particular we were showing in Chicago, and this guy, this girlfriend of a guy, said, hey, you know, my my boyfriend watched the movie and he quit his job and he's living with me now, and uh, <laughs> he's so thanks. <laughs> He's doing a Kickstarter. You should tweet about it. Um, <laughs> um, so it's your free DVD. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So so the the reactions have been like a lot of wonderful things and and, uh, and and really beyond what we ever thought. Like it's weird that like 13 year old, 12 year old kids are watching a documentary. Like we get a lot of of 
emails from kids saying that they are really excited by this or they make a video of themselves on YouTube, like reviewing it at 12 o'clock at night um, in their bedroom so their parents can't hear. Like it's it's, it's bizarre to see the life and, and the way that the, the people in the film have touched so many people, which is, and it's about making games, so it's kind of weird. Um, so let's open it up for questions. I have a number of them here crazy technology of like, people asking remotely, uh, but I wonder if anybody in the audience has any questions. And, and I, I guess we should repeat the questions. I don't you want me to do that. <laughs> so how, how do we uh, choose to characterize people? Hmm, I, I think, I don't know, like I, I think we, we I, were capturing people at sort of an, an elevated time, so everything is, you know, a little more high stakes than usual. Like, I would say that all the people in the film and their their day to day now, after this experience has happened, are much more l like low key versions of themselves. Yeah, and and actually, like Phil had like joined us for a few Q and A's and was asked very similar questions, um, and he kind of says like that's that's what I was like then, like in that moment, like we we literally were filming these people at the most stressful mo periods of their lives, and and just like the, this kind of crazed thing. And a lot of people, I think, go through similar periods, but there's never a camera crew, uh, you know, kind of there and then asking you to talk through what's going on in your mind. Um, and so, like, that's, I, it's, it's a small segment of their lives, which is like where the story kind of revolves around. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's, you know, not completely, absolutely the full, full picture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we we didn't get to add here. So so the game Fez did come out. It came out on uh, Friday the thirteenth in April, and uh, and it did really well uh, on uh, on Xbox. And um, Phil's doing great. Uh, he's in Montreal. He's creating lots of new things now. Uh, he has a girlfriend, which is awesome. Um, uh, and we did film an epilogue with him, but it was we didn't get him when he was releasing the game because we were already on tour with the film, which killed us because he was in with his new girlfriend in Nashville and we were in like Chicago. I wanted to be there so bad for that. Yeah. So we did, we did film with him. We filmed with him in Montreal after the game had actually finished in uh, December. He sort of finished in December. And then uh, we caught up with him at the game developers conference this year where he won like the top award, um, which was a big validation for him. Uh, so he won the Seamus McNally award, which is the, the biggest award you can get in independent gaming. So we followed him through that, uh, through that day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the how, how it came about was um, like we always thought like wouldn't it be great if we were on Steam? Um, and we were actually introduced to the Steam folks uh, through Ron Carmel of World of Goo, and then also Edmund McMillan, who's in the movie. Um, and they just kind of hooked us up. And then it was about eight months of arm twisting yeah. in a way, like like subtle arm twisting, because we're like, hey, uh, do you want to? Yeah. Eventually, we we flew down to uh, Seattle, and we said, okay, uh, we know that you don't do movies, but we'll make it into an app, so it's easy for your system. And it will be moderately interactive, but not really. Um, and um, we'll show it to you. So we, we went down there and we showed them, and they had a really great reaction to the film. And um, I think it, it's sort of an experiment for them. Because what's interesting is if, you, if, you're, if you're on Steam and, let's say, your friend is watching uh, Indie Game the Movie, it says, what, playing Indie Game the Movie, like, they're not set up for movies right now. This is sort of a big exception. But uh, it's been incredible. Steam has been the strongest platform for this film. Yeah. Yeah, like we're hoping numbers no. wise. Yeah, um, and and they're they're really merchandised really well. Like they know how to do online sales and and all these things that the movie sort of areas like we're on Amazon and and all these different places. They don't do those things yet. These guys sort of know how to do sales and stuff. The 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 so that we basically follow in real time Super Meat Boy. Oh, so the question was, um, why are they all successes? Or yeah, was that planned? Or yeah, was that planned? Uh, no. Uh, we, we filmed with a lot of, uh, sort of, a lot of developers, but they were all sort of interviews and nobody was in, in the moment developing. And the only two teams that were in the moment developing that we followed were Super Meat Boy and Fez. When we caught up with Phil, we weren't sure if he was going to finish, um, at all. Like, he was at a point where he was, like, you sort of see him halfway through the movie saying, I, I don't know what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do. Um, and nobody knew how well Super Meat Boy would do. So it was really just by chance that we, we started, you know, following them that it, they ended up being, yeah, well. like Super Meat Boy had had buzz, and and that's how they got on our radar, and and kind of then we kind of did our research on them, um, but they didn't they didn't have like you're going to sell a million copies buzz and be game of the year type of thing, 
Uh, and so when you see it uh, in the movie, when all the reviews are rolling in, and Edmund is, is genuinely surprised at, at all these things. Like, no one is hating this game. Um, like, no one, no one is saying, like, horrible things about it. Um, and I, I guess he was kind of, like, half expecting that, but, but there were just, like, these amazing, huge successes. Um, and, of course, that's not every indie game. Like, we, we know that uh, for sure. Um, and we're not trying to say that, but it's just the stories of these games. Um, yeah. Yeah, but so and it was kind of to hook up with a year and a half before they became successes. Yeah, they we did interview uh, like in terms of like we had a few sort of talking head expert types. Um, we did interview women, and we, you know, we got comments from them. But the, it just it turns out that the the people that we talked to didn't say things that connected in a way that we needed to explain what we wanted. Like we could have shoehorned a, a woman into the film as an expert just to have a woman, but. They didn't say the, the things that we needed them to say. Yeah. And I think, like, at one point, it was going to be, like, this essay-type film with this narrative back end or narrative, like, arc being, like, the, the structure and then these little vignettes happening. And it we did capture woman interviews uh, for those pieces, but then as things evolved and the stories of Fez and Super Meat Boy kind of became these more involved things that kind of demanded more time in the film, it pushed out all these vignette pieces that we thought would be there. We thought we'd have about five or six vignettes. And, uh, and the women that we spoke to were talking in past tense about the games that they had made. Yeah. Um, so it didn't connect into, into the story. And it was more just a function of story uh, than it was any sort of deliberate choice of having all white men in the movie. Like it, who, are, who are making platformers. Yeah, or all white men all making platformers. Making platformers. That wasn't, yeah. uh, that wasn't a choice. High concept platformer. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, no? Yeah. We, we did interview him and we included him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there wasn't a specific reason. Um, no. He wasn't at PAX, like uh, so. He was he was there during sort of the beginning of it, um, and we we include a little bit from that sort of yeah. section that trip. But he didn't appear at PAX until like the third day, um, and so that was sort of a, yeah. a sort of a story problem as well because he didn't show up as much later in the film and wasn't present later in the film. Um, we couldn't show more of him in the beginning of the film because you'd wonder where he was later. It's sort of a story thing. Yeah, and also like one of the main theses of the film is kind of uh, games as personal expression. That's like one one of the sub theses, and so we are kind of really drawn to people who are making games that are kind of a reflection of themselves. And Phil, as the designer, kind of had spoke more to that. Uh, Renault definitely, obviously, has huge influence in the game, and it, his fingerprints are all over that game. But it just kind of it felt more natural for what we were pursuing to just kind of concentrate on those four guys. Yeah. Did Did you? Um, on that note, did you try to reach out to uh, Phil Fisher's partner? That's like all pixelated a couple of times, but yes. has no dialogue or monologue whatsoever. That was a hugely surprising storyline, sub storyline that sort of happened. Yeah. Um, we didn't. We we arrived in Boston thinking that the the that we knew Phil would be nervous about showing the game for the first time in four years at, at PAX, um, but we didn't know about that until we arrived. And it was sort of uh, sort of taking us sort of by surprise what was happening. Yeah, yeah. So we filmed that lobby scene, and we didn't. We we kind of thought it wouldn't end up making it in the film, but we had to we had to show it because it ended up completely clouding what his, like Phil's reaction to Pax. Like all of a sudden, you just have this guy who's really depressed at Pax for no reason, or just like really really super stressed out, and you, you don't know why. So we ended up including it, and it just um, yeah. And we we tried to kind of tell the story from the point of view of the the creators and we wanted to you know it's the story of making fez and what phil's going through and uh we didn't we thought if we kind of went into this dissolution of a partnership thing and kind of like told the whole story of that it would kind of be this weird off branch and kind of like take the movie into a place that is further removed from you know making this game and pouring everything you have into this game so yeah we didn't we didn't really pursue that no I think it was the most interesting aspect and surprising story about post-release that we came across. Um, it was actually kind of this through line of everyone who had these wonderful successes. Um, they go through like this kind of postpartum depression uh, of sorts. Um, and John's was the most dramatic and surprising. And we thought that it kind of dovetailed really nicely with the other two stories we were pursuing because with with Fez, you have a game that's kind of in development and will they make it or won't they make it. With Meat Boy, you have a game that's you know, fully developed and released and so you get to see that part uh, of the process. And then 
with with John, it kind of fit really nicely thematically uh, to kind of have like you know what happens after release, and so it kind of you know predicts into the future what's in store for Edmund and Tommy in, in some way. You know, of course, it's a very extreme example of that, but it just seemed um, it just seemed like a like a great take on that section of, of the process, yeah, and just kind of dovetailed quite quite nicely, and and we we think it, it shows a, a sign of John that is really surprising. Like, I think he has an internet persona, and I hope this kind of goes against that internet persona a little bit. That's a small, light question. Uh, the, the question is, uh, <laughs> yeah. why indie games matter? I, I, like, um, what was interesting to us about uh, pursuing uh, independent games was that it, it was just, it's just people doing something different with a, a medium that you're familiar with in a certain way. So. These are people that are, are pushing that in a, in a different direction and exploring sort of smaller personal things in the same way that, you know, you would have seen with independent film in like the 90s or the 70s. Um, like people using a medium in a different way to tell different stories. And that was compelling to us. It was also compelling to us um, because these people are, the, the people that we follow, and maybe we're like this too, um, are kind of obsessive. And, and I think it was just a neat way for us to look at creative obsession and that creative process through these these artists as opposed to other kinds of artists like poets or filmmakers or whatever. I think we were interested in, in looking at those ideas through these people. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, agree with all that. Like it, That's like, why it mattered to us, rather. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so actually on that note, like you, a lot of the things you portrayed in a movie, like the, you know, the agony of creation or, or the sacrifice you have to make and the kind of vulnerability you put, or like yourself, you put in a... In a um, those are universal, right? And I think that's why a, a lot of people reacted to the movie the way they did, even if they you know, never played games. Um, I'm curious if there's any parallels between those things that we saw and like your own adventure in making a movie. Uh, any kind of, you know... Totally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we went crazy this past two years. Like, it was... It, it's been up and down. Like, it's a, it, a lot of the same things. Like, the idea of, you know, putting yourself out there through your work. Like, when this went out there, I thought, what is everyone going to say? Like they, th we value certain things, and by choosing these things in the film, they're going to see what I value. Um, that was sort of a, a thing, and then having it all over the internet and people on YouTube saying awful things, um, like <laughs> that was sort of and and great things. But 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 just like in the movie, you know, you'll have like you know a thousand positive comments, and then you'll have like two or three negative ones, and all you pay attention to is the negative. Like it, it seemed like every emotional arc in this movie we went through making it. It, it felt in many ways that. We were filming ourselves like six months into the future, although we had no idea of knowing it. But it was like, you know, we're filming Tommy crunching for his Xbox deadline. And then, you know, fast forward six months and we're crunching to hit this festival deadline. And then we lose all our renders the, the day before. And, you know, it's just like all these all these th things. We're fixing that, bugs in the Steam app up until the minute that it goes live. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it was very it was remarkably similar. And we didn't we didn't realize that when we were making it. I, I found this photo and I think this is your photo, but correct me if I'm wrong. Ah, uh, uh, that was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think someone needs to make a movie about this thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we've, like, we've been both making, you know, videos and, and television for about 10 years. I started, um, I got a, I was really lucky, I got a job at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and I worked in television, um, in television news and then worked into lifestyle television like gardening shows and then I ended up in, in documentaries and so I was sort of working in documentaries and, and James has a slightly different background uh, yeah yeah I was um, kind of went to university and uh, I took a, a when you're going to when you want to be a filmmaker in Winnipeg Manitoba uh, it seems like a, a silly thing to pursue uh, so when I went to university uh, I took uh, business and then I took film studies on the side and um, I thought and if you're in Canada and you want to go into film you either go to Vancouver or you go to Toronto so I went to Vancouver trying to break into film and uh, I couldn't get a job at all so I took a job as a games tester for electronic arts and I spent two years there and um, it was the best and worst job I've ever had in my life and uh, I it actually turned me off games for for a while I hadn't touched games for like eight years until actually discovering indie games uh, that kind of brought me back to games but I'm getting off topic um, so shortly after that I moved back uh, to Winnipeg and someone offered me money to do a high school graduation uh, and videotape it and so I was like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. I'll do that. And then it was just like this thing clicked in my head. It's like, oh, people will pay me money to do things with my camera. And so I that turned into another high school graduation, which turned into a wedding, which turned into a commercial. And then it kind of created this, you know, 10 years of doing 
commercial corporate work that kind of grew and got more ambitious with time. And yeah, eventually I left CBC and started working with him on yep. commercials. And so we were doing commercials in Canada and it was, it was going really well. Like we had worked up to a point where we had like national clothing retailers. It was like, whoa. Yeah. We were finally getting the jobs and gigs that we wanted, like the size and the budgets and all that stuff. And it was, it was literally, we were fight, like in Canada, there's a lot of like RFP lists and we were finally on like the, the rarefied lists, like the ones that you really want to get onto. And then we decided to make this <laughs> and so. we, we kind of naively thought that we can make this in about a year and not only will it take a year but we can like take breaks and do like a knock off a commercial gig for cash flow and stuff like that and um that didn't happen at all it was like indie game 24 7 for the last two and a half years i just kind of took over our lives um but but it, you know all through that period we've kind of been doing everything like uh shooting editing uh motion graphics and it just always worked for the projects that we were on and so we just kind of naively took that thinking into indie game thinking that uh this would just be like you know 18 five minute videos that's that's all we need to do that type of effort uh and it wasn't at all um but you know we learned a lot of lessons doing it and and i think we're better for it but i think our naivete kind of worked in our favor because had we known we might not have done it um i have one online question that's maybe rated a little bit did you miss any great moments while filming did you have to restage anything no, no, no we, did, we didn't. Rest we didn't restage anything, but there was a lot of uh, things that could have happened that could have had us not capture certain things. Like, for instance, at the at the end of the film, uh, Edmund has this wonderful sort of sort of post mortem where he, interview where he talks about you know reflecting on the experience, and it, it would have been much more difficult if he had shaved. He was about to shave off his beard. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, basically. Edmund just like watched the reviews and it was like the, at the end of like his four days of release of Super Meat Boy and I went to the hotel to offload footage and kind of give Edmund and Danielle some alone time and um, Edmund was this close to shaving for the final interview which would have completely screwed up everything and Danielle stopped him from doing it not because she thought it would be bad for the movie but she thought like it you know might be something that the, they want to get for the movie. Um, but thank God that she stopped him because otherwise we, we would have had like this weird, it, it would have been a title card, Edmund shaved. <laughs> and then, or, and, you know, CGI. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or CGI. Facial hair changes actually sort of were are kind of a timeline in the movie. And so that would have screwed up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can kind of like see their their, their state, their, their kind of like me mental and emotional state uh, as like through their facial hair. And yeah. And head, yeah. What's uh, next in Humble Bundle, maybe? Suggestion. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, well, because we're self-releasing, we're still on this uh, this thing. We're probably going to be on it for about another five, six months. Uh, and I've been underestimating everything all throughout this thing, so it's probably like... He says five, six months, just think a year. Year, yeah, yeah. So we're going to... We're, we hope to actually be starting something new. Uh, we mm -hmm. have three ideas, and we're pursuing all three of them. We're going to kind of see what sticks, and we hope to start filming in May, June of next year. Watch for the Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Humble Bundle would be awesome. I, I I think that would be cool. They they haven't done movies yet, but Steam hasn't done movies. Oh, they they cookie, cookie right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, no, those those guys are awesome, and we love what they're doing, and we would love to do it with them. So I uh, uh, in the process of of researching this, I um I just want to show this picture because I think it's the most awesome thing ever, and I kind of want to hear the backstory. Uh, so um, there's. <laughs> Will Arnett and there's a power glove and Christmas, so it's like almost too much. But I, I wanna I wanna know what this is because this, this is, is all his idea. Yeah, this was um there was a local radio station in Winnipeg and Will Arnett does awesome charity work and he was there with the United Way of Winnipeg. Uh and they were launching this this fantastic thing where they were giving jet season tickets to uh sick kids and it, really awesome stuff. And uh, he was in town promoting that, and the radio station had this contest. Like, get your office together to take a photo with Will Arnett, but he like staged it. And well, well, yeah, it, it was supposed to be like it was like basically, yeah, um, highest bidder, you know, gets their Christmas card with Will Arnett, and then you can send it off. Christmas you card. Your company Christmas card, and you can send it off to all your all your customers and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so I bid, and we won, and it w th these are the only marketing dollars we ever spent for the movie. <laughs> um, and so I think he was kind of expecting just to kind of go and do like, hey, how are you? And, and do like a meet and greet type of thing. And um, I had plans. And so I directed the photo shoot. 
I was like, yeah, no, we want you to put on this red sweater, which he didn't want to do, which was understandable because it was kind of gross and he was very, he looked very good at the time. So he just kind of hung it on, <laughs> on his shoulder and I was like, okay, uh, and you have this present and it's going to be a power glove in it. And he didn't really know what a power glove was, but he was really game and he was really nice about it. <laughs> and uh, you'll open it and we're going to be proud parents, then you'll put it on and and we'll take photos throughout the whole thing. And then we turned it into this album art and that was our Christmas card uh, for that. And yeah, yeah, so that's, and he was, yeah, he was awesome uh, throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Um, on that note, uh, yeah, um, I'm curious, um, we have five minutes, so maybe one or two more questions. Yeah, totally. I, I'm, I'm curious about the, um, the kind of iconic Super Nintendo controller kind of hanging there in the, in the, well, everywhere pretty much. Yeah. Uh, is there any story behind that? Yeah. Um and, and, and why Super Nintendo and not like I don't know NES? At, yeah, we've at, gotten that question before. At, Atari, <laughs> joystick. Atari. Um, <laughs> that was actually the first thing we ever shot. Uh, we were we went to breakfast one day and, and we were talking about this idea of doing a film about game design and game development. And, and then we sort of left and we we're like, yeah, yeah, I think this I was think about we'll like start four or five months before we actually even decided to do the movie so we were just sort of talking about it and we walked outside in a back alley and there hanging was a super nintendo controller from the sky and so we shot it and we were just we shot it as like it was like a little bit of a sign in a way um not really realizing what we'd use it for just oh that's kind of interesting incidentally there was an nes controller just like down the road <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't as artfully hanging. Like it, it was, it was, it was, it was there. But it just wasn't. The, the composition like a, wasn't good. This is an area in Winnipeg that's called Woolsey. It's kind of artsy, and so there's just you know random things hanging from the sky. Um, yeah, and so we we did our first Kickstarter in May 2010, and we needed a little bit of video to put on the front of it for whatever reason, and we included uh, this video, and we put like Indie Game the movie beside the controller, and, and that ended up being the uh, Vimeo tab, um, and that went everywhere. We just didn't realize, and so that was sort of the, turned into the image just through gro Google search, essentially. Um, ended up being the main image for the movie, and it just sort of stuck. And so we didn't fight with it. We just kind of left it. Yeah. And th this is kind of like, like Indie Game the movie was also a working title. We thought at some point we'd come up with something much more evocative, you better. know, something, <laughs> something better than that. Um, but it was kind of like one of the, the downsides to communicating from day one, even before day one, actually, uh, of shooting, is that you... You know, you're you're marketing your film and you're talking your film, but you're kind of also laying all this groundwork. And we kind of just thought of it from an audience building perspective, and we weren't really thinking about. You know, we just thought we can change the title and kind of morph the image of the movie as we need. And it just got picked up so much more, so much earlier than we thought that um, we felt that you know, kind of compelled to kind of stick with it. And and we kind of and we kind of liked it too. And it we kind of liked that you can kind of read into you know, the image and what it means and all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, originally it just started as a pretty picture in, in front of our Kickstarter campaign and we just kind of ran with it. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, a neat lesson to learn about communication, um, you know, and being so open uh, so early. Um, I wouldn't ever dissuade anybody from doing that, but it's just like something that I would consider a little more for our next project. Yeah. So, so I think the last question... You can learn a lot about, you know, making games, making indie games from the movie. I was curious if you could share if you have one piece of advice if you want to go and start make a documentary. I'm kind of selfishly asking because I'm curious, but I, I hope other people are too. Like, what is there one thing that you learned that you had no idea before that would be important and you can pass on to other well, people? Well, we, sh we shot about 300 hours, but I wish we would have shot more. So just never turn the camera off. That would be my advice. Yeah, on that, like, because there are so many moments in the movie that are actual you know, beautiful moments, uh, really strong moments in the movie that we were this close to turning the camera off and then this magic just happened. And sometimes even when the magic's happening, you don't really realize it, you know, that that it that is happening and that'll end up in the movie. Um, like Danielle crying in, um, there's this one scene where Edmund reads a review and then Danielle kind of breaks down into tears. And that was, that, that was something, that was one of those instances where I was like this close to stopping record. And, and, and actually packing up and leaving for the night. And then this kind of beautiful stuff happened. Same thing with when she's talking about the cats. Um, you know, it's just like, I just thought, I thought that was a throwaway piece. I thought, you know, that's kind of like, it's, it's a cute moment, but it really worked really, really well to kind of, you know, add a little bit of levity right when you needed it. Um, yeah, so, so never stop filming. And also, I would say uh, to people out there, like I know a lot of other filmmakers that 
wait for everything to be perfect. You know, they wait until they have their perfect script and that they have all their budget and that they have the perfect camera that they want or they're waiting for the next camera to come out and all these things that can really just act as like these hurdles towards you actually getting out there and making something. Like, had we waited for situations to be perfect for this movie, we probably wouldn't have made it. And so, like, I'm, I'm a big fan of kind of just going out there and doing it. Maybe you won't do the job that you wanted to, but at least you've got out there and you made something and you could build on that. And the next thing will be better because you'll be learning through actual doing. But a lot of people, yeah, they, they just kind of wait until everything's absolutely perfect. And it very rarely ever, ever is. Great. Well, on that note, I suppose. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Uh, again, it was, it's a great movie for those two people in the audience who haven't seen it. Please do and or see it again. Uh, thanks for coming. And, and uh, if you want to stick around, we actually have a 16-inch version of CyberVision. <laughs> uh, other than that, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.